We are all hopeful that you know who you're here to listen to, but as a little background for both our moderator and the artist, Enrique Martinez Salai was born in Cuba, and he was raised in Spain and Puerto Rico. Uh, and he moved to the United States, but he's been living in the United States since he was 18. He's got an enormous list of accomplishments. He developed an early interest in art and was apprenticed while he was in Cuba. He studied science, philosophy, and literature. He studied applied and in, applied in engineering physics at Cornell, and he pursued a PhD at uh, UC Berkeley in quantum electronics. So, uh, attended Skowhegan for painting as well as getting an MFA at the University of California at Santa Barbara. He's taught there as well as at Pomona College and he's been a visiting professor at, presidential professor at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Uh, in his spare time, he founded in 1998 a international public publishing house that distributes books on um, poetry, philosophy, history, uh, his own writings as well, and downstairs in our bookshop you can see any of those. There's a whole nice selection of those if you'd like to learn further about Whale and Star Press. He's exhibited in the United States, Europe, Asia, and is uh, included in many public collections, including in our own city at LA County and MOCA, the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego. This past summer he's had the extraordinary privilege to have a beautiful sculpture called the Tower of Snow that pays tribute to Operation Peter Pan, which was an organization that brought thousands of Cuban children to the United States in 1960 and 62. It was on in the great courtyard of the Winter Palace of Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. And another version of that has been dedicated recently in Miami at, at uh, the MDC Tower for facing the port of Miami. It'll be right across or diagonally across from where the new, university, uh, the new uh, Miami Art Museum is being built. So it's there at the port, everyone will see it as they come, and it's a fantastic work. Um, our moderator of tonight, uh, also a man of many accomplishments, Patrick Frank. Uh, he's lived his life in many guises, and <laughs> a social worker, a prison librarian, he's managed a wine store, and he's earned a living playing classical guitar. But in fact, he's a brilliant art historian. He's earned his master's and PhD at George Washington University. He's taught at the University of Colorado and the University of Kansas. And he now devotes most of his time to uh, textbook writing, art forms, and the introduction to visual arts, a textbook standard text that's now in its 11th edition. He's written books on modern art in Latin America, including <coughs> Posada's broadsheets, Mexican popular imagery, Los Artistas de Pueblo, Prints and Workers' Culture in 1920s Buenos Aires, Readings in Latin American Modern Art, and he's recently completed a new figurative painting in Argentina, 1960 to 65, uh, in concert with Jacqueline Barnett, and working on a new edition of 20th century Latin American art. So we're very pleased to have him as our distinguished moderator, and I hope you'll all welcome Patrick and Enrique. Those introductions always make one sound better than one really is, <laughs> right? But Enrique, um, you had a show here a couple of years ago, and this is a new one. Um, what have you been doing since the last exhibition? Um, so, uh, since my last exhibition, I have had another kid, um, <laughs> uh, four in total, and I have been uh, doing projects. Um, uh, 
both in the United States and abroad, um, have been living in Miami mostly, or working in Miami, living in a small town, and sort of been uh, working on some very large scale um, things as well as writings. Um, it's, it's always a little hard to tell because there are a lot of things I'm always doing. So, uh, they, and they don't seem to change, but there's, there's always some stuff. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about the new pieces that are on view here and on the floor below. Um, how would you describe the new steps that this work involves? How would you describe the, the new endeavors that you're undertaking in this new series of things? Um, you know, the, I always work for an environment, for, for rooms, for spaces, for galleries and museums. When I was working for this space, I had all along the drawings of the gallery. Um, and I was thinking about this as a space rather than merely just a passive vessel in which to install the stuff. So, so this, this show is really, I think of it as an environment and it's an installation. So what's new about it, um, I would say that this is a, uh, I think all artists want to always say this thing that I'm about to say, so. <laughs> but I think in some ways it's, it's a conclusion of, of many years of working in a certain way about painting and looking at the relationship between paintings and sculptures and see what paintings can and cannot do. So it is new to the extent that I feel is a, is a more refined version or some problems that I have been trying to address for some time. Uh, and, um, and, and I think in many ways they, they represent also a new stage um, of working, of thinking about what I'm doing differently than I have before. What, it, what was the uh, biggest challenge you had to work with or chew on or wrestle with in bringing these works to bear? <clears throat> Well, I mean, I, I think, I think, um, I think that the biggest challenge has been um, painting. Um, I think painting is a very problematic thing. I have been thinking about it for a long, long time. Uh, and I think to, to, to launch oneself in making certain kinds of paintings of this kind of imagery that you see around here and have them perform the way I have wanted them to perform um, was quite difficult. Some paintings here, um, have taken uh, a year and a half to make, um, a year and a half of failures while making them. So, so I think that that has been the biggest, the biggest challenge ultimately, um, understanding what my position is in relation to those paintings. When I get close to your works, and I mean all of them, <clears throat> the closer I look, the more I see in terms of layers of things. I see into it a little more, and I look especially around the edges is where it's the most noticeable. Which painting in this room has had the longest evolution from start to finish? Um, probably the, the one over there with that strange little um, cave the passageway. Cave um, and I think, uh, I think the, the video that L.A. Luber produced <coughs> Um, shows some of the stages of this of this painting as it was being worked on. What's the title of that work? Um, I can't remember. Okay. <laughs> so the, t the way I title my works is I, I do writings that are the preparation for this work as opposed to sketches of, of, other, of, of their artists do. And then in the time of titling, I go back to my writings and lift fragments of my own writings, uh, which always have that in front of it. So there are pointers. Okay, so can we walk through the stages of how that work came into being? What it started out looking like? Sure. What, what, what first popped into your head? That's a very good question. Nothing is the answer. Um, I, I, I try very, very hard not to pre-make paintings. So the, my, the writings that I make are not writings about this imagery. They are not writings about the paintings themselves. There are some ethical reflections that clarify my position in relation to the paintings. I should say, at the risk of maybe making it more confusing, that 
my approach to making work has been influenced by a lot of things, but particularly sort of samurai readings that you prepare, you prepare, you prepare, you prepare, so when you are working, you are not, you're not preparing, you're not considering. So to a large extent, this, this, so that work, I try to think of nothing before I start. I just know that I'm in the right place, or hope, I'm often not in the right place, but one will hope, but I'm trying to be in a place that when I confront that, the pain, something will resonate back to me. What, what first went down on the canvas? Do you remember? Yeah, I mean, I remember the first image that I had was, which is very strange, as I start working and start working and there is this passageway and at the other end of the passageway there's this field, which is very much what's there. And that's very unusual. Most of these paintings go through much bigger transformation than that. Then I have second thoughts about that for the next eight months. So I painted over, destroyed it, the, the thing appeared again, destroyed it again, the field disappeared, destroyed it again. Then it was a light cave, there was a dark cave, there was cold, it was not cold. Um, and all of that movement had nothing, not much to do with, with is this painting looking good? Mm -hmm. How much of it is trial and error? It sounds like a lot of trial and error. Like, like you put this up, it doesn't work, try something else. Um, well, it's, it's trial and error of an emotional location. So it's, um, it's not trial and error, like let's see if pictorially this flower will make this painting look great. Um, in fact, most of these paintings have been more beautiful along the way. Um, and they have been destroyed for the sake of something else. So, so it is the trial and error of recognition, seeing what is, what is this, um, and what is true and what is not true and what is false. How do you tell when you're in the right state? I mean, you mentioned being in the right sort of mental frame set. How do you tell if you're in the right mental frame set? When you start painting, um, I think that there's something about thinking about art yeah. that is completely um, delocalizing. Um, and only when you start working is that you realize um, whether you are there or not. And, and the, you know, there are many paintings that I have tried and I have not been mature enough, smart enough to make, and I have only realized that midway through the paintings. And I'd say, well, this painting will have to wait for indefinitely. Um, and sometimes a painting, many paintings, you know, this painting here, the one that we're talking about, for instance, I, um, I, I thought it was destroyed, like three quarters of the way through it. This painting by here, um, uh, really was very difficult to make um, because because I set myself up, as I try to often in painting, in a hole that I couldn't do it. I mean, wh I, when I set up a painting like this, I am not thinking that is gonna be a good painting. I, I don't think that. I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it probably helps them be better if you're not thinking it's gonna be good. But you know, I, I think that a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of artists that I know have a, a priori canon of what is the zone in which they're mining. And therefore, a lot of the decisions of what's good and not good are a priori. They exist beforehand. Sure. So for me, I don't really have that in the same way. So, so what I like to do is to start in a place of deficit. When I start a painting, I start in a painting that I think is already is already a losing proposition, and then see how it moves from there. There is a lot of, how shall I put it, archetypal, uh, primordial imagery here that suggests deep stories. I mean, that looks like a womb, a cave, a secret compartment, you know, and it's got inscriptions on it. How, how related are you to that idea of the primordial unconscious, like say the Jungian unconscious self. Does that make any sense to you? Well, I know what it is. Yeah. Um, but um, I mean, to, to a certain extent, I mean, you can't, 
all the, all the images that I use are very basic. They're images that they have always been around. There's nothing interesting about them. They're, they're, they're familiar, they're trees, they're dogs. And I'm interested in that familiarity and see how that familiarity can become unfamiliar as you engage it, as you work with it, um, rather than start the other way around with a surprising image that it seems unfamiliar and when you engage it actually becomes surprisingly familiar and dull. Um, but I don't think my, the construction of my painting is in the construction of archetypes or Jungian symbols or, in fact, they're not symbols. I, uh, I am far, very far away in my looking at, at this uh, semiotics and, and, and sort of symbol usage. I think of them in a different way. Um, but, but they are definitely connected to things, and, if, and sometimes weird things happen that echo what you're saying. For example, in this painting, uh, this relationship of, of, this, of the dog and the, and the uh, unicorn here emerges out of the writings of, of a collision between a certain mystical promise of youth with, with domesticity. And when I finished it, I thought, how strange to have a dog and a unicorn. And then I look at the tapestries of the unicorn and there's a dog and a unicorn there. And so I don't know if you want to say, well, this is tapping into some sort of collective awareness, or is it just some weird memory? Or is it maybe there's something fundamental about this collision that uh, there's no discovery? Um, you seem to resist the idea that our consciousness is formed by mass society. Right? I mean, you were reflecting, thinking, writing, creating images. And the images that you create come from your imagination, okay? And according to a various theories of the imagination, the imagination is related to memory. So you're painting things you remember. Now the things that you seem to remember are pre-agricultural, pre-industrial, ancient kind of things. Do you resist the modern memories that you have and uh, experienced? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, what I try to do is map the world that I see into a world in where things are clearer to me. It's a mapping. This works as a mapping. I, the problem with doing figurative paintings is that everybody wants to read them as images. So le let me explain it in this way, which I don't know if it would be clearer, but in 1972, when my mom and my brother and I got into the plane to leave Cuba, um, my mom was crying and I sat next to her. And, um, and I realized she was crying, so I tried to look like I was just cheery because I figured that that way uh, she would feel better about me. Um, so that's the memory. But that, to me, is no longer interesting. I'm 48, that happened 40 years ago. I've known that image for a long time. It is hunting, but what I'm interested in is why is it hunting? What is true about that memory? Who was I? Where did that little boy go? What was left behind? What was lost? Those are the things that are interesting to me. The image itself is just an anchor, a pointer to where everything else around it that is very abstract, like where did that boy go? I mean, how abstract is that? Begin to have a life that, that, so to talk about the image or to talk about exile and all this stuff is really, to me, highly, you know, not, not that interesting. And if you have read a lot or thought a lot, most of you probably don't find it that interesting either. Um, the question is, well, what is interesting? Interesting is something that we have not thought about and the point is not to impress each other with the same knowledge that we all share but to discover something that was secret, a secret, a mystery. Have you ever been tempted to put anything in from the mass media in your paintings? Um, no, I mean, um, I, I, I find that, I don't know about you, but I certainly find that cynicism has been the the great contribution of the last, of modernity really, of the last 150 years. Um, my world is very opaque, cynical, mass-constructed, 
uh, cliche. My own mind is that. So what I'm trying to do with my work, as opposed to when I go to Burger King or something, is to discover a more radiant world, a world that is an alternative to that, a world that restores for me the radiance the world had when I was a kid. So um, I have no commentaries to make about popular culture. Um, I mean, I will listen to the Eagles in my drive of PCH, um, <laughs> but, but I, I, I have nothing, hope so. nothing to, to contribute in my work about that. Um, let, me, let me bring up a very specific example of a way that I know of that one of your works evolved because I saw the, the series of photos of how the work downstairs, the largest work, that she picks a bird in a tangled, rambling thicket. At an earlier stage of that painting, there were two birds in there. What happened? Why did you paint the other one out? So, I mean, the, the, the answer, I laugh a little bit because the answer is always so resistant to generosity. Um, it's it's the, because the bird didn't work. I mean, that's, that's one way, but let's, let's expand what that means a little bit. What happens is, uh, all along, this, this, this work had a particular reference to Harry Martinson, a poet that I like very much, who, um, who was an orphan and who was left in Stockholm while his mother moved to Oregon. Um, and, and sort of this boy waiting for the ticket to come to Oregon and waiting and waiting and waiting. Um, so in some ways, m the spirit of Martinson was throughout there in that, in that painting. Um, and at some point, the other bird seemed inconsequential uh, to it. Um, and you know, here's the thing, it's not, it's not that I'm trying to be coy or anything, it's that sometimes the more words you add to some of those choices that you sometimes make in, in our work, um, the more of a lie that it becomes. It's, there's something about a recognition. You know, when, when you meet somebody, when you meet somebody and you look at them and they're telling you whatever, they're telling you how w wise they are or whatever, and you look at them, and you don't get that feeling. You don't get that aura. And when you say, well, how, how, why don't you? What, what, what word did they say? How did they move that didn't convince you? And anything you say would, would just be slightly off, but you know that they didn't convince you. And it's a little bit like that with painting. When I walk around and see your works, sometimes what I do is I try to imagine a sentence that describes the imagery that I see there. Like, in a snowy landscape, a nearly transparent unicorn circles a brown house on a hill. A white unicorn is subjugated somehow by a large German shepherd in a, in a flowery field below a blue sky. Those sound like the recipe for uh, magic realism or something like that. How do you feel about that, the way I'm doing it at least? Well, uh, I don't like magic realism, so, so that <laughs> so all of a sudden puts me in a complex position. You know, um, you know what happens is I actually like your, your sentences. They sound kind of nice to me, um, but my work is not psychological. Is sort of, I, I, I like to describe it as philosophical rather than psychological, trying to make that distinction. Um, they are, they are, they seemingly, they are apparently about strange stuff. They are apparently about unicorns, they are apparently about, but it cannot possibly be about a unicorn in a dandelion field, right? This, it cannot possibly, I mean, I guess it could be about it, but there is enough clues, I hope, to say, well, not to compare my work to this work, but like when people say, when people say, well, what is Moby Dick about? And you say, well, Moby Dick is about chasing a whale. And you go, well, have you read it? Because if you have read it, it would be hard to say that. And I think that with the aspirations of my work, and the aspirations I think of most work of art, is to not really be about what they seem to be about. Not b because you're trying to be cute or hiding behind the scenes or something, but because sometimes you have to go around something to get to the something, you know, the, 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 the path 
as Dante will say, you know, the straight path is not available to you. So you have to go around it. I mean, I, I never set out to be a 48-year-old man painting unicorns. I mean, it was not, it was not planned. There are a fair amount of unicorns in the show here. Um, how does that, why did that happen? Well, I mean, I was interested in, in what they represented. Um, not represented necessarily mythology, but what they represented as a visual image, uh, uh, the sort of the promise of, of something that is not. I mean, the world probably will be more interesting had there been unicorns around, right? So, so, they, so they represent a certain illusion and delusion, uh, particularly in my case, in this body of work, of childhood, the promises of childhood, what, what, what children hope the world will be or, or how it will be colored. Or, and in some ways, they, they represent, um, to me, an impossibility. And an impossibility not just as an image, but an impossibility as something to paint. To say, today, I'm going to wake up this morning, I'm going to paint a unicorn, and I'm going to force the material to insist that the things come to life in some sort of suggestion. Um, and then the problems that they bring up, and they say, well, this is, this is serious. You know, if, if I make a, a very large piece of cotton steel, and I place it, you will know that that's serious in some ways because we have been trained to think of that as serious. But when I am interested in, in the seriousness that one finds in the alley rather than the main street of seriousness, the seriousness that comes sort of from the side, I mean, um, I mean, I keep, com I keep making these references. I'm not trying to tie up my work to this tradition, but you know, like, so if you know that metamorphosis and Kafka is not really about a vermin, right? You, you know that that is just a silly proposition. <laughs> um, Charles Baudelaire said something that I always remember, and it kind of inspires me too. Let me see what you think of this. He said, I prefer the monsters of my imagination to the triteness of actuality. Isn't that true of you too? Um, it's very beautiful, but I don't think it's true of me. I am. Um, I'm actually a very realist person. I like, I like the actual thing. I mean, mm -hmm. I was a physicist. Um, I like what is, but, but sometimes, sometimes to, to understand what is, you sort of have to, you know, when, when, we, when we say actuality or when we say what is, we tend to have a very 19th century deterministic idea of what it is. I, uh, but, but you know, the world is very complicated, I think, and, um, and nuances. So say, if what is, I look at my father, my father twists like this, and he glances down, and, and I try to understand that glance for the next 20 years. I mean, how actual is that? I mean, where's the actuality there? I mean, what was the real thing? The situation might have been quite simple, but the hunting, the moment where reality cracks and and opens up and you get lost in that and you can never return from that. That's, that's, that's a territory that I wouldn't describe as anything but real, yet is not concrete in the ways that we would want to measure. Um, you said in one of the writings, you said that uh, all artists should aspire to be prophets. What does that mean, a prophet? I mean, you know, I think today most artists aspire to profits. <laughs> um, you're, you're right, but um, I, I, think, I think the aspiration for us, you know, we, in some ways, um, the, it's, it's a crazy idea to aspire to be prophets like sort of Pushkin or Dostoevsky will have aspired to for that. Um, seems ridiculous. We think like, well, we think we're not good enough. I mean, who am I to be a prophet? But it's precisely the, the, um, the impossibility of that um, that makes it so alluring. Um, you know, of, of, of low delivery, of banality, of, of no surprises, we know a lot already. I mean, we live this life where everything that we do 
and people around us are, are fairly expected and we rise to just often the most basic level. So to ask ourselves to rise to another level, however much we failed at that, uh, seems to be interesting. And, and if you're gonna be an artist, or, or let me speak for myself, I will only want to get up in the morning to do that. Not because I will succeed, in fact I have failed until now, or so far. Um, but, but, but why else would I want to get up in the morning for? To do what? To make something pretty? So that, that, would, be, that would not be that interesting, not, not worth all the sacrifices. To make money, there may be other ways to do it that are more efficient, um, and, um, and so on. So, so there doesn't leave a lot of reasons for me to want to get up and be an artist. And that one seems worthwhile. I'm the, uh, I'm the interviewer here, and I have various uh, modes in which I could pursue this task. I could do it like Larry King. I could do it like Barbara Walters, you know. What kind of a tree would you be? What kind of a tree? If you were a tree, what kind of a tree would you be? Um, um, well, I like all the trees. You, I mean, I just see them all in the, in the things. I, and sometimes like them more than, than a lot of other things. Um, a lot of your paintings have a certain, um, and I'm changing out of the Barbara Walters mode here. Um, a lot of your paintings have a certain sense of, of a displacedness or confusion or um, at least uh, dislodging from reality or the norm or what would be expected. And there's always a sense of, um, of I don't want to say lostness, but something like that, that, that matador down there standing on the tree trunk in front of a mountainous landscape is very small and he's, he's out of place. So much of your art narrates those kinds of experiences and feelings. Is that because yeah. you're out of place yourself? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm out of place. Um, and not just because the typical narrative that is applied to somebody like me is because I left my country when I was a little kid, I will be displaced, and displacement comes from that. But the, the truth is that you know, I was out of sorts before I got in that country, <laughs> on that plane. So, um, so, so, um, my own experience of of the world is one into is a confrontation of of against this landscape and the recognition of what is the place of oneself in that landscape. I mean, how does what I mean? Everything, everything to me is a question. Like home, what is home? I. I At times, because books like the one you read and stuff, uh, people have assumed that, that sort of I'm an intellectual artist. I'm actually an artist of questions because everything that seem people, other people seem to have found out, I don't seem to understand very well. I seem to find everything very questionable. I mean, I, and everything, you know, if I look at my daughter or my son for more than two minutes, I realize I don't know anything about them. Um, and I, I mean, Matterlink has this beautiful line that says, the great secret is that all things are secret. I mean, and, and that's what it is. Every time I look at anything, I discover everything goes deeper and more. So, so yeah, so I mean, it's, I'm, 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 I'm out of place. I, w I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know what the alternative means, really. I mean, I Everybody is a certain way. I mean, you can't escape yourself at a certain point. And if that's the way it is, that's, that's absolutely what you work with here. Um, in, in your statement accompanying the show, you said that your art should be an exploration of the ambiguous and fundamentally unknowable forces and memories always at play in our move through our life. If it's fundamentally unknowable, I mean, a lot of things are fundamentally unknowable. I don't know if they play baseball on Planet X. It's fundamentally unknowable. And also, it doesn't even matter, right? So if something's fundamentally unknowable, how do you know it matters? Um, well, I mean, I think there's a lot of things that are unknowable that in the process of, of 
grasping for them, um, you, you learn a lot of other things about yourself in the process, about what is knowable. Um, I mean, to a great extent, science is pursuing the unknowable, and then you discover a few things along the way. So um, I think that all the mysteries that are interesting to me, I, I recognize from the onset that there's nothing I will do with my work to, to find out what those secrets are. But, but I will be able to, to more or less suggest what the landscape is. Yeah. I would say, well, I don't know what that bear is hiding, but it's over there. Um, and I think that's sometimes good enough to get, a, to get a guidance for life. Well, you know, William James talked about the heuristic value of things. And that's what it reminds me of, the way you say that. Um, has this new set of work suggested a, some future ideas you'd like to pursue? Um, well, you know, I have, I have a number of projects that I'm committed to do, but I, 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 as I said before, I try not to, to think of any ideas until I'm actually working on them. Although I'm working on another project already started that is somewhat connected to this, except it's a very, very large installation. Um, uh, I mean, I feel that this body of work has opened up for me a number of questions um, about what, how I want to be an artist in some manner, and um, and. Uh, and what I want out of specific out of painting more than anything, um, and what painting is, which is such an elusive thing. Um, so yeah, I mean the, the show is, has been tremendously important to. Ever, you know, I have done all these other projects while I've been working <coughs> on the show. So this show has spun off satellites of other investigations that have been very important to me. So so it has continues to generate certain productivity, and I walk around here today looking at these pieces and thinking um, how, um, how little I understood them. Wow. I'm ready to uh, entertain questions from the audience members. Folks here I know know a lot about Enrique's work and been following it for a while. This is your chance to uh, ask something, yes. Hello. Um, I was just interested in, you said that your process with painting is that you don't necessarily have a predetermined um, idea. And I'm wondering if you approach sculpture in the same way or if uh, you, you know, have to work with any type of sketches or, or you know, work with someone who fabricates or if the um, process is just a little more complicated. Um. Yeah, sculpture. Sculpture is is different. I mean, I do I do some some of the sculptures I do are very intense sort of environments for for things, commissions, or uh, and those require some sketches. I don't like this part about it. I don't like to. I always feel that if I know what an artwork is going to be, I don't need to make it. So I need to sort of <laughs> keep myself at the edge of knowing what it is. But you know, the, the sculptures require holding itself up in space which is always a real problem for me because you, you, you can't just throw it together. And so yeah, now you have to do armatures or supports. And, uh, and I like immediacy, um, so which ends up being catastrophic for many of the things that I make. Um, and you know, I, and I, make, I insist on making everything myself. Um, so the people who help in my studio, I have them do the business side and I do the work. So, but I have a foundry I work with. So, a sculpture is different. Um, and it seems like you can't explore as much in the process, right? I mean, that's where you have to stand there. And, you know. Right, I mean, you, you can in some ways, except, like for instance, that sculpture was done without the little animals. Um, so, so I was, I was, I was thinking about a particular part of the Swedish landscape, and um, and I was making this sculpture, and when it was finished, I go back to my writings, and I thought something is missing on this, mm -hmm. um, and then I I went back and 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 reworked it, 
Um, so, and, and, and I have reworked many sculptures. Sometimes, I mean, like I have a sculpture right now in the studio in wax of a little boy standing there with his fist tied like this. And I looked at him one day, I show up, and I was tired and I was looking at him, and I cut his leg, and then I put a stick. And, um, and it was just devastating for him and uh, for me. And then I had to hold, I figured out a way to hold him while I did all this because nobody had arrived in my studio. So, but that was very impulsive, and chances are it, I ruined it. But, it, but, um, but I think I want to preserve that, that freedom, which, which is a, it comes naturally to, to work like that. Who else would like to ask a question? Yes. I mean, out of all the things that you could have chosen, the unicorn shows up in so many of your pieces, and it just seems like it has some sort of meaning to you, and I'm just more curious about that mythos. I know you're not doing a mythos, but he's shown up in five of your pieces, so what does the unicorn mean to you? Well, I mean, I think, I think there is, um, so let's see how I walk this fine line. You know, I never talk about the meaning of my work. I, if you read all the stuff I read, I've always managed to elude it. It's a yeah. trick. Um, but um, let's just say, let's just point to this painting here of the home and the unicorn. Both of those images are um, mystical to me. One is familiar to everybody; the other one isn't. But to me, the idea of home is is just as mystical, as promised, but not delivered as a unicorn is. Yeah, so, well, it only shows up for this exhibition, and then it will disappear. So <laughs> I will. Um, it will. I. I like. I like. I like what it does. I like the fact the transformative quality of of a horse with a horn becomes something else. Not so many things have that rotation. Um, I like the connection that it has to the past and I like the infantile quality of it that, that makes me think of children. Um, and I, I like the threatening quality of that horn. All of that comes to play. And then I, I, I use all of that sort of with it and against itself. So I'm not so much tapping into some uh, narrative of the unicorn, although it's inevitable in some ways, but I, I'm, using, I'm using what you bring up from that history into it in some manner. But I, I say this all the time, and I, and, I, and, I, and I know that I never explain myself well about it, but nothing in these paintings is but an instance that was true for now. I might tomorrow be an abstract painter, or maybe a singer. Well, I'm a very bad, very bad singer, so. But, but I, w I might be something else, in the sense that the truth of this work for me, as I found it, is in the immediacy of what was happening then. I'm not attached or married to the images themselves. The images were ways into a certain resonance, but, but they, I, I would not, be like perhaps other artists are, that now I'm going to do a series after series after series of unicorns, um, and then you will say, well, what is this? You know, like, and if you look at my body of work, there's some books downstairs, you will see that some things I have done seem to have nothing to do with it. And to me, they're very much the same. The, the underlying philosophical problems are the same, although the embodiment is really different. The problem, I think, is that art is so much so visual and it's so much like I think we're used to thinking of it like furniture in some manner that that we are so attached on what is given not what's underneath what's given I think literature has a certain freedom from that yes in the back hi I was really interested in what you said um, I believe you said it was something relating to the samurai when you said that to prepare I, I hope I don't I didn't write it down immediately sorry when you said prepare 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 so that when you are doing you are not preparing or there was some right. statement like that 
it really, out of everything that you've said, helped me to understand that all the things that you've done, whether you're a physicist or you know all these things that you've done, are in a sense this kind of Bushido-like preparing for you know these m these moments, these nows that you're talking about. And um, I wanted to just make sure I have that right because that's something I'm going to take out with me tonight. It really meant a lot to me. I wanted to let you know. Is that what you meant? Yeah, that, that's, that's what I meant. There's a beautiful book. I mean, there are many books, but there's a beautiful book called the Hagakure, which is the book of Hagakure. means the rustling of leaves. It's the book of the samurai. And, it, and in it, it, it talks about this. But I mean, I think Anthony Tapia is quoting a Buddhist idea. It says you're either thinking about it, or you're on it, or you're thinking about it. And I think that in many ways, for, for me, anything that I'm doing, uh, whether it's taking care of my kids or, or preparing a book or, or this, is, is really all part of, of the work. And, and when I go to the work, all of that, let me stop there and change a different direction. I mean, at the end of the day, I think that the difficulty of making art is to know who you are in front of the thing you're making and doing. Really, that's, that's what makes it difficult. And whatever helps you, or at least for me, helps me clarify that position, clarify my stance. So much about making work is knowing the work you don't want to make. Um, and, 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 and sort of knowing yourself to an extent at least knowing your positions, your, your ethical stance in some manner, then you're, you're sort of ready. When I cannot make work, when I'm confused about my work, it's never about the work. It's never like, oh, can I really execute this painting? It's never te a technical problem. I mean, I don't think this, I think this is true of every art. I mean, most artists don't have a technical problem with what they're doing. The problems are always, I mean, who are you making this? And, um, and, and, and it's easy to, it very easy to get lost in that forest. So I think that everything that you do is an exercise in polishing uh, your capacity. So when you're standing in front of the work, you just do it. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, I wanted to learn a little bit about the decisions that go into how you articulate these scenes um, in terms of not necessarily a finished quality, but rather um, pieces like this and the black work downstairs feel a little bit more stark and minimal versus some of these, like the one behind you, which it seems like every detail, every element is accounted for. Um, what's that purpose serve for you? What is, is that supposed to be a function of recollection or something else? Yeah, that's a very good question. So I work only from memory, so I don't use references. And, um, and I like, and, and my notion of representation moves around the whole spectrum. I have no boundaries or no allegiances to the kind of work I make. So um, I might make a work that is just a writing, and I will make, make this and the other one. Um, is I'm glad that you brought the, the word scene up because this is a problem. I think uh, for, when I was younger, I, I really couldn't make any of these scenes because I found they were very theatrical and, and therefore just an undermining of the nature of painting. So the way I have resolved this is by taking these paintings that you see and I, um, everything about them, you first think that this is a scene, but if you get close to it, you realize it's not. It's paint, smashed up, the edges are incomplete. The, the image becomes unstable, unreliable. That unreliability of this image is very important. It's, it's, it's those kinds of things that hover around the initial impression of the work, and ultimately is what matters. So when I spend a year and a half making a painting, I spend that time doing those things. Like, uh, the paintings are very flat, but then they have all these messages that articulate, create a hollow space and bring it back. So when like the painting of the birds downstairs, 
most of my time there was moving slight details that you cannot recognize because they're not using linear perspective to create a space and then undermining it play someplace else. So I can take the fabric of that painting and make it very taut. And when you stand in front of the painting, you might feel a particular emotional thing. You don't know where it's coming from. Maybe you do, but, um, but I don't know where it's coming from. It's coming from all those tensions. So you, when you look at, say for example, a painting by Velazquez, where the ground of the painting is the same thing as the back of the painting. I mean, you don't usually stand there and say, how could the ground be the same as the back? How could the edges be in the edge and the back will be behind? But when those paintings are so powerful because the architecture of those paintings is so incredibly, amazingly executed. So you don't, I don't need to look at a rectangle suspended against a red field to say, wow, those are great tensions in play. So, um, so those things are happening here. Um, or trying to happen in here to make paintings um, believable for me. Well, le yeah, let's, let's talk about that because you're bringing points that I think a lot of people often ask. And so the w I never think of the work as saying. It doesn't say, you know, anything in, the, in that sense. It, it, uh, hopefully, if the work is, is doing something, it will, be, it will be something as opposed to say something. Um, it's not stories in the sense that um, what I'm trying to do is not to create um, a narrative that you have to decode. If I knew what it was in a, in a straight words, I'd just tell you. Um, the problem is that, that there, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of moments, there's a lot of aspects of life that seem to have a deficit for me of awareness and understanding. I'm trying to reconstruct those things map them into a place in which something will be more apparent. You know, something that is commonly done, for example, in physics is you have a problem in, say, in a circular charge in a, in a, in a ball, and to understand it, you, you, have, you have to map it, say, to a flatter, to a flat plane, to help you solve the equations better. That's sort of what I'm trying to do here. Um, life, I find it too, too complicated too difficult, too dense. Um, even the smallest exchange, even when you and I are talking, is if I, I can only move on by kind of staying on the surface. If I decide not to stay on the surface, I cannot move on past this exchange. So, so then the question is, what else was there? What else was there? What, what, what are the other things that animated that moment? And then I try to figure out what those things were, so I can have a better awareness of what that reality was. So that's what it is, and then I try to make these paintings to be lanterns in the darkness of that reality to show them to me. Not to say anything, but just to be, to show, to reveal something to me. So I have nothing to confess, no stories to tell you. <laughs> I am trying to, to say there's a problem here, there's a there's something here. Let me see what it is. Speaking of cancer, I've got one more question. Who would like to ask the last question? I've known you through about five of your studios, and every one of them says, keep your actions faithful, scrawled at the top of the wall somewhere. And in talking about approaching your paintings tonight, and not coming at them with the predisposed idea of what they're going to be, and allowing your actions to take them, can an action be, can faith exist without action? 
and is your faith in the unknowable? Yeah. Um, so they keep your eyes faithful. Is um, can you hear me? Keep your actions faithful is a Buddhist idea that what you do, what you say, and the way you, you think will be the same, will be lined up. You can imagine how hard this is to do for all of us. I find it very difficult. If I were to write a book of failures every day, it would just be a long page. But so, so the question in the studio is to write it there as a reminder. So my studio, I put booby traps of things that would remind me to not get confused, because as, as you know, being anybody is confusing, but being an artist in an art world that is so full of very different kinds of expectations and demands from every, if you listen to all the things that you, that you hear, it's easy to get confused. So I keep that in my studio. So going to your question, Jack, I think, I think the faith, uh, I think what the faith is in, in a concept that has been in recent postmodernist um, uh, thinking, you know, kind of being pushed aside, and it's the notion of authenticity. So, so to, to a certain amount of authenticity in the circumstance, in the moment, and, um, and, and in certain ways, be faithful to the conditions and to the needs that you have to be authentic in that moment. And, and because the moment changes, what it means to be authentic in the moment changes along with you. And if you give up on a series of rules, this is who I am, this is the artist that I am, this is what I do, but rather you allow that identity to be porous, to change and to be flexible and adjust without fear that at the center of that there is some something that is, is some sort of ethical center that you can rely upon, that you can just bend without losing yourself rather than say this is who I am and force yourself like a hard rock into every situation. And I think that if I were to approach the, my work with the knowledge. I started painting when I was nine years old. So, I've, like, uh, and say, well, I know what painting is. I think I will have to stop. I will just not know what to do. So I have to approach it with the sense I have no idea what painting is. I know some painters, and the more I know them, the less I know what painting is. So, let's try to see what happens. And with that sense without the insecurity that if I let things go to be faithful to the moment, I will end up with nothing, which is a fear I think people have, that if they just let go of the little hard shell, at the end they would not be that painter that makes you know, lollipops or red squares or that throws things around. I mean, and I think that the entire system in many ways colludes or, or, or forces, I think, artists to, to remain true to a lie, to what you have been. I remember when you used to make those elephants, I want you to make more of them. Um, so, and, and that's the way people talk. The trajectory of a particular artist is you used to make lollipops, then you made elephants, and then you make squares. Um, and that's you typically the least interesting part of the journey of an artist, any more than the journey of Nietzsche was from the, you know, the particular little nugget here, nugget there, nugget there. Rather, it's just a whole person trying to remain alive through the changes. Um, this conversation uh, is enriching, Enrique, and um, it is great of you to come and share your thoughts and your creations with us. And fortunately for all of us, the conversation doesn't have to end right now because we can now go downstairs and have a little bite to eat and continue our discussion. So thank you all for coming. Thank you very much.